It's a blessing to see all of you here this morning. We'll be in Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verses 45 to 50. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. You know, to the world, today is kind of, I guess, a, a special day. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's a day when the world is kind of set aside to think about some things that really, we know, we think about every Sunday. That we, through the Lord's Supper, have the chance to think about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I I don't know about you, but I never really think of Easter as really any different than any other Sunday, because that's, that's just what we do every Sunday, you know. We, we stop and we think about this. But I do feel grateful that the world wants to stop and have a day to think about this. You know, I, I do feel grateful that, that that's something that the world is looking for. And, and while certainly we want to help them get all the way to all that God desires for them, it's, it's good that people are looking for that, because the world in general feels as though, I think, all hope is lost. You know, that, that really is the whole idea between the, the modernist and postmodernist movement, the idea that, that nothing means anything, and that nothing has any value, nothing has any meaning, that if we're all just a, a collection of sales that sort of accidentally uh, appeared out of nowhere from a big bang, then, then we have no purpose, we have no reason for living, we have nothing to hold on to and nothing to look forward to after this life, and that creates a very hopeless world and a very hopeless environment and it, it reminds me a little bit of a song there's a song that uh, a hymn that's called um uh, it's called a uh, uh, well i can't think of the name off the top of my head but the lyrics go something kind of like this i'll remember the name because it's in the lyrics it says as the storm clouds gathered in the evening sky the day breaks cloudless in the morning uh, Here's the title. It's the first line of the chorus. Ask several questions. It says, how long until we see the morning? How long until we see your face? Oh, Lord, guide us through our journey until we rise above them, or guide us through our troubles until we rise above them in the morning. The name of the song is How Long Until We See the Morning. And it starts with this idea of clouds. At, at the evening time, when the darkness is coming, because darkness has always been a symbol and a picture of uh, hopelessness, of the feeling that the morning will never come and that we'll never be able to get past our troubles. You go all the way back to the time of Moses, when, when there were the plagues in the land of Egypt, and you remember the ninth plague was the plague of darkness, a plague so thick that you couldn't even see your hand right in front of your face, and that should have been a warning, a sign to Pharaoh that without a softening of his heart, there was only terrible things coming. There was hopelessness in that darkness. And of course, the 10th plague was a plague of death. Darkness makes people feel that all is lost. And so it's very fitting that Matthew opens Matthew chapter 27 in verse 45 with Jesus hanging on the cross. It's fitting that he opens that with darkness. It says in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45, Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And as they crucified the Son of God, in essence, there's the same plague from Egypt, this darkness over all the land. And it appears to be a very hopeless situation. Even Jesus, at first glance, sounds kind of hopeless when you hear what he says. It says that he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then there were those who were near him. Upon hearing this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. He's, he is desperate on his, on his last leg. And, and someone took pity on him. It says that immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it up to him to drink. But the rest of them said, this is hopeless. They said, leave him be. Because let's see if Elijah comes to deliver him. And all that Jesus has left is just to cry out one more time. And it says he yielded up his spirit. And at first glance, it seems like a very hopeless situation. It seems that he has doubts, that, that he's asking why God would abandon him. And then 
he doesn't even wait to die. He yields up his spirit. He just lets it go. But when you look a little closer, you see that the words that Jesus spoke, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are actually really infused with hope. They are full of light and hope. And they speak to us that in our darkest hours, we have a path forward, things that we can do that help to fill our lives with the same hope that he had in his darkest hour. And so what do we do when all hope is lost? Just like Jesus did, we can, first of all, lean heavily upon God's word. That's what we see in verse 46. Verse 46, when it says that about that ninth hour, he cried out with a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's easy to put Jesus on the cross and to just think of him as a sacrifice in that moment, because that's, of course, what he's doing there. He is a sacrifice. But it's important to remember that even when he was hanging on the cross, Jesus wasn't just a sacrifice. He was still all the things he had ever been, including a rabbi. For three years, Jesus had been a teacher, a, a rabbi. And so he had used the tools of the trade that rabbis often used in that time. And one of the things, the, the teaching tools that rabbis often used in Jesus' time was something called recitation. And in essence, it's kind of the same idea as, you know how someone might sing a song or you might hear a song, and all you need to do is just hear one piece of the song you know really well, and then you can't get it out of your head, right? I looked this up. According to some internet sources, the most well-known song in the world, everyone, basically everyone everywhere knows this song, it's a Christmas song, that doesn't surprise you, does it, is White Christmas, right? And, you know, saying the words White Christmas in song, you probably already hear it in your head, don't you? And all I have to do is say, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, and you don't need me to say just like the ones I used to know, it's already playing in your head. That's the same idea as what the rabbis did with recitation. They would choose a passage, and, you know, their internet access wasn't as strong as ours is today back then. <laughs> They couldn't just look up Bible verses very easily, and they didn't usually have a Bible they could carry around with them, so they memorized scripture. If you wanted scripture with you in your day-to-day -day life, you put it in your brain. And so all the rabbi would do is he would pick a passage, let's just say Psalm 23, and he would say the first line. Uh, uh, Psalm 23, it starts, <laughs> my brain is just tired today, y'all. It starts, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He just says the first line. And then all of his disciples, all of the people listening, they would pick up with him and they would say it with him. He uh, l makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me uh, beside the still waters. He restores my soul and, and on and on, you know. And they would say it together. Well, as it happens, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the first line of Psalm 22. It's the first line of a psalm. And so as a rabbi, Jesus is starting the first line of a psalm, and you know all the people there, they couldn't help themselves, even if they didn't want to. Their minds just automatically picked up and began to play the rest of that psalm in their head. Now, I think there's two reasons why Jesus picked Psalm 22. There's two reasons why he chose Psalm 22 to express how he felt and what they needed to learn as he was hanging on the cross. And the first one is the time of day. Did you notice Matthew mentioned that very specifically? He said, at about the ninth hour, Jesus said this line. At about the ninth hour, that's about three o'clock in the afternoon. And you know what happened every single day at three o'clock in the afternoon in Jerusalem? Every single day, there was the evening sacrifice. And so the priest would take a bull, and he would slay it, and he would lay it on an altar, and he would burn it. And do you know what they very often recited at three o'clock during the evening sacrifice, very often, Psalm 22. One of them would begin, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And everyone there would pick up and they would recite this psalm together. Now, not every day, but often at that exact time in the temple, as a sacrifice was being burned for the sins of the people, they recited this psalm. And so I think the first thing that Jesus is doing is, he is reminding these priests and these, uh, or I'm sorry, not priests, these scribes and these Pharisees who have gathered around uh, Jesus as he is being sacrificed. He is reminding them that, did you notice they skipped the sacrifice to mock Jesus and be there at the cross? He is reminding them that there is a sacrifice being made right now for their sins, where very likely they are saying this psalm. He wants them to be thinking about 
sacrifices for sins, because of course that's exactly what he was too. Now, I think the second reason why Jesus quotes from Psalm 22 is because of what Psalm 22 is about. If you turn to Psalm 22, and you might leave markers in Matthew 27 and Psalm 22, because we're going to flip back and forth between those just a little bit. But if, if you turn to Psalm 22, it starts off, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And he goes on, and for quite a while, he talks about his struggles and how, how he feels like, like everything is over and that, that there's... There's uh, not a lot for him. He, he says, I trust God. I know he's going to work this out, but right now it feels terrible. I think that's probably exactly how Jesus felt on the cross. Terrible and abandoned. You, know, you, can, you can know that God is working it out, but sometimes you still feel abandoned. You still feel that angst and that, that struggle. And so he goes on like that for a while, but then in verse 21, Psalm 22 and verse 21, he says this, he says, Save me, he uses some pictures to describe kind of the struggle he's in. Save me from the lion's mouth. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. And then there's this sudden turning point, and he says, you have answered me. Jesus is, is reciting this psalm that the Jews already knew was about more than David. They already knew this was about the Messiah. They didn't understand it was about his death, but they knew it was about the Messiah's struggles. And so he is reciting the psalm that they know is about the Messiah. And do you know what it says in the middle of it? It says, he has victory coming. You have answered me. And he goes on to describe this great victory and how he will overcome these struggles and how God will bless him. Now, as he's hanging on the cross, these are the words that Jesus wanted us to be thinking about, wanted them to be thinking about. These are the words that Jesus was thinking about. All hope seems to be lost, but he remembers what comes next. You have answered me. And I'm sure those are the words that, that could have come to mind as he rose from the dead in that great victory. And so in Jesus' darkest hour, what Jesus does is he leans back on God's word. He leans on God's promises to remember this hour is not the only hour. This hour is not even the last hour. It be the last hour of his life, but not the end. This hour is not it. There is victory coming, and he finds strength to move forward because he knows the promises of God. It's very much the idea that we find in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 3. In Isaiah chapter... Let's see. 25 doesn't sound right, but we'll see. It's not right. Let's see here. Twenty-six. It's for Isaiah twenty-six. In Isaiah twenty-six and verse three. In Isaiah chapter twenty-six and verse three, he says, God will keep him in perfect peace, who sets his mind upon the Lord. His mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. There's perfect peace, trust, for the one whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Now, stayed, that's the idea of, of this is what he's always thinking about. This is where his mind is set. It's staying there. He is always thinking about God. But it's a little bit more than just an intellectual thought. It's a little bit more than just pondering God or thinking about God. The word stay is really literally the idea of to lean on. And that perfect peace comes because he's thinking about God, but more than that, he is emotionally leaning on God. As someone has struggles and anxieties, as someone has temptations, when they let their mind rest on God, more than just thinking about him, but to trust him, to emotionally lean on him. That's the idea of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, when he says in 1 Peter 5, 8, cast all your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. It's not just thinking about God, but it's trusting him. It's resting that mental burden on God. That's where we find peace. Christ is thinking about God's word and the promises of God, and he rests his mental burden on God and finds perfect peace because he trusts in God. And so by leaning on God's word, like Jesus, we can find the calm and the comfort enough to really hear what God is saying. 
And that's really the next thing we see in Matthew 27. In Matthew chapter 27, it says in verse 47, that there are, though, there are some who stood there when they heard that phrase from Psalm 22, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That they said, this man is waiting for Elijah. Now that might seem very strange. Why are they thinking about Elijah? And it's because of a kind of misunderstanding that they had. It, you can almost see the connection there. Eli, the, which means my God. Eli, and then the word Elijah, Elijah. It, it, Eli is at the beginning of the name Elijah. And so it, Jesus, they didn't misunderstand his words. It says he cried out with a loud voice. They knew what psalm he was quoting. They knew what he said. But they filled in Elijah because they had some misunderstandings. They were waiting on the wrong promise from God. Do you remember from your Old Testament, God had promised that someone like Elijah would come and that someone like Elijah would pave the way of the Lord. You can find this in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Malachi, that, the last book of the Old Testament, the one that really talks about how Jesus will come, and a few hundred years later he did. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, it says that someone will come who will pave the way of the Lord. He's going to make the minds and hearts of the people ready for the Messiah to appear. And then at the end of the book, Malachi chapter 4, in Malachi chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6, it says he's going to be someone who has the spirit of Elijah. He's like Elijah in some way. And so the Jews were waiting on Elijah, someone like Elijah, to come. And that was right, except Jesus already told them that he's come and gone. All you have to do is go back to Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 14, in Matthew 11 and verse 14, Jesus says, The one like Elijah has already come, and his name was John the Baptist. And he paved the way of the Lord, and here I am. And now John is dead. So the Jews here in Matthew 27, they're still waiting on Elijah because they haven't really been listening. They haven't really been absorbing God's word. They don't understand that Elijah has come and gone. And so they're waiting on Elisha so that the Messiah can come. When Elijah is gone and the Messiah is here, and that's really the point as it continues, it says that there was someone who took the reed with a sour wine. Sour wine is really just the idea of a painkiller. It's a homemade painkiller that was vinegar and some other things that was supposed to, you know, they, when they had sympathy or pity for someone dying on the cross, they could offer it up to him. Someone took some pity on him and offered him a painkiller because he thinks this is the end of his life, poor, poor guy. And then the rest say, you know, we're not even, we don't have pity. It, let's just see what happens. Let's see if Elijah really comes or not. Because they're still waiting on the wrong person. And if they had just been thinking about those words from Psalm 22, go back to Psalm 22. If they had just been thinking about those words, they would have felt eerily similar to exactly what they were living in that moment. In Psalm 22 and in verse 7, Psalm 22 and verse 7, Jesus has prompted them to recite this. They're reciting it in their mind whether they want to or not. In Psalm 22 verse 7, it says, All those who see me, the, the Messiah, they ridicule me. They shoot off the lip. They shake the head. They say, He trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him. He, let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now, if you were a scribe or a Pharisee in that moment, and you had really stopped and been thinking about that psalm like Jesus wanted them to, you had really stopped and been listening to the words of God, you would have got to this line and you would have said, hold on, that sounds eerily familiar. And you know why? Go back to Matthew 27. Like We'll flip back and forth a little bit if you want to mark it. Psalm uh, Matthew 27, right before these verses, just, just two or three before that, starting in verse 41. In Matthew chapter 27, in verse 41, it says, Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, they said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Now here's almost word for word. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. They should have come to that point of this psalm, and if they were really listening, they would have said, we literally just said that out of our own mouths. You pick up in Psalm 22. Pick up in Psalm 22, and in verse 13. And there's, there are several similarities here. We're not going to look at all of them. But especially look uh, at verse, uh, let's see here. I'm sorry, verse 16. 
Psalm 22 and verse 16. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. If they were really listening to God's word, they would have said, hold on. Didn't we just put nails through his hands and through his feet to hang him on the cross? And there is example after example like this in Psalm 22 of moments where if they had just really been listening, they would have said, this is about him. And you know what? If this psalm is about him, then verse 21, God will answer him. Somehow, God is going to bring him the victory because that's exactly what David prophesied about him. And so it sort of screams, the Messiah is right in front of you. Sometimes we have hopelessness in our darkest hours because our ears aren't open. God has said things that are intended to give us courage and hope when things get hard, when, when things in our right life are all going wrong, when our health is failing, or our family is not working out how we thought it would, or whatever it is that happens to us in life. God has words of hope and comfort. And when we really lean on God's word, we find the strength, the, the clarity, the rest, the peace to really think about what he has said and find those promises in his word so that we can let go of that anxiety. We can let go of, of that stress in that dark hour. The dark hour doesn't always go away immediately. Jesus still had to die on the cross. He still had to suffer all of that. But we can let go of all of those things with it and be able to put our hope and our trust in God's promises because we can really hear them. The people in Jesus' time did not hear what he was saying, but he offered that to them when he started quoting Psalm 22. He offers it to us too, but then his word will just stop and really listen to it. And when we do that, we find the strength to hear all that he said, to do the things that make all of this better. We find the strength to know that Jesus suffered on that cross because of my sins, because of our sins, that Jesus died on that cross in my place, and that he gives me the opportunity and the chance to step away from those sins, the things that, that put him on the cross in the first place to say, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. I am removing myself from those things if I can. He says, you can. You don't have to be caught up in that anymore. And, and the opportunity to make that confession that he is the Son of God, to make the confession that he is the one who saves our soul, who loves us so much that he died for our souls, and who has given us a path forward. If we will submit to his ways to make him the, the master because he gives us the best possible life, his boundaries are the safest and securest way to live, that we can make that confession and have the courage, have the strength, just like he had to die on the cross, to die in the waters of baptism, lowered into a watery grave just as he was lowered into a grave, and raised again to new life, that we have the strength and the courage to submit and to trust that this is the way that God has given us forward. This is how God cleanses those sins and takes them away. This is how God adds us, not just to anybody, but to the body of Christ, the people of God, this is how God gives us hope in our darkest hours. This is how he leads us forward. And this is how he allows us to relinquish whatever happens next to him, to just let it go. That's what we see in verse 50. In Matthew 27 and verse 50, it says that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and then he yielded up his spirit. Yield is literally, he sent it forth. He, he let it go. He let it leave his body. And you know, there is great strength that comes in letting go of the illusion that, of control of your life, especially in our darkest hours. You know, it's in that moment that we want to cling down tighter. We want to not whiten up a little bit more. We want to feel like we have control. We want to feel like we can do something to pull ourselves out of these dark spots. But when we let go of that, and just trust God with our lives. Trust God's word with our choices. Trust God with, our, uh, with the outcome. However this works out, God is going to make it good. 
when we let go of those things, we, we are able to, to die to self and have all the good that God has promised us. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is now not I that live but him. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I can let go because I know how much he loves me. I know that he gave himself for me. And I know that if I give my life over, if I give the outcome over to God, if I yield it, I send it to him, victory follows. That's what Psalm 22 says about the Messiah. That's what the Messiah wanted to bring you. That's what he wants you to have. The victory that comes with letting go and letting God be in charge. Let him handle that. Jesus' darkest hour was for our victory. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus' darkest hour was suffered for you and for me. And so if he was willing to suffer his darkest hour so that we could have victory over our darkest hour, then keep hope. That's what God wants for you. Keep hoping through your darkest hour. Remember 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 10, Peter says, May the God of all grace, the God who has enough grace and love to allow his son to die for you, may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory, what we're all reaching for, that, that better, day out of our darkest hour he called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while Peter's a realist he knows because of sin there is suffering in the world because we live here on earth there are things there are dark hours that we are going to go through he says after you have suffered a little while he will perfect he will establish he will strengthen he will settle you. All those words are really just words of saying, he has a home. He has a permanent place that is for you. Keep hoping, keep trusting on that. Keep leaning on that promise in your darkest hours. And that day will come when all the dark hours are over and you are there in eternal light forever and ever. Today can be the day that you take your first steps toward that eternal light. Today can be the day that you take your first steps toward uh, looking into God's word and asking those questions of, how is one saved? Today can be the day that we step into the waters of baptism and add you to the Lord's church and let God wash your sins away. Today can be the day that you find strength and hope <laughs> and courage to overcome whatever darkness, whatever sin, whatever struggles you are going through through the prayers of the church, the wisdom that our elders and the Bible offers, and, and through the hope that God gives. Please come forward now as we stand and as we sing.